I'll invite you to grab one of the blue inserts you can follow along with the sermon and the text. As I noted in the introduction to the service, we're in a series right now where we're thinking about love for other people and how we make love known, how we put skin on our love by the, the actions and the love that we show to each other within the, within the church and to the world, the, the world outside the church with the, with the hope that we might welcome them in. And last week we started with the premise and we're going to extend this premise into this week that that's and you can this is the first fill in security in Christ cultivates safety among us in other words the more secure we are in the love that God has for us the more certain we are of our standing with him the more sure we are that he loves us totally unapart from anything we do the more secure we are in Christ the more we'll love each other and that's a little bit of a spectrum our security, though it's not based on us because we're sinful people, we put our trust in other things. So the more we are secure in Christ, the more we love other, other people. And so we want to extend that today. And last week we thought about how am I secure in Christ. Today we want to think more carefully about what does that look like? If I'm secure in Christ, how can I be a safe person? How can we be a safe place, a safe church for, for people to come in and hear and experience not only the love of God through our actions, but the word of Christ as we open up his word? So we want to think about that carefully today as we unpack and think about John's, John, in John's letter. This is what John says. It's, it's, a, it's a word about, it's, an, it's a continued encouragement as we've heard again and again throughout 1 John. A continued encouragement to love each other and to love other people. This is what he, he writes, 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Everyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed. He made it evident. God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, here it is again. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will all, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen and he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. This is the word of our God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, you loved us. You loved us before the world began. And then you loved us in the fullness of time. Father, you loved us before the world began. And then in the fullness of time, you sent your son Father and Son and Holy Spirit, you loved us before the world began. And then in the fullness of time, Father and the Son, the Spirit, you sent the Holy Spirit to us at, at the, on the day of Pentecost and in our own lives too as we came to water in the Word, as we listened to your Word, as we receive your supper. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do your work again today that by the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts we might be that, that, they, that these words and our meditation might be pleasing in your sight. God, you alone are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
today I, I want to talk about loving and being a safe church and safe people using the image of a tree. Keep coming back to this throughout the sermon. I've never seen, I don't know if you have, I've, I've never seen a tree be anxious or afraid. I, I've never seen a tree shake, you know, with fear. You know how we do when we're scared, we shake. In, instead, no matter what's happening, the tree stands strong and tall and firm. It may blow in the wind when the wind blows it. it may, the leaves may fall when the wind blows or the rain beats down on it. But I've never seen a, a tree afraid of what's happening around it, over it, next to it, or below it, or even inside of it. A tree is just firm and tall and strong, and as such, it provides shelter and safety to any and all who come to it. In the midst of a rainstorm, it's probably not a good idea during a lightning storm, but even in the midst of a, light, of a, of a storm, it's, you go under the tree and you find a measure, at least, of protection from the rain and the elements that are beating down on you. And, and birds make their nest in its branches. Squirrels make their nest higher up in its branches. And did not Winnie the Pooh make his home underneath the tree? In, in fact, sitting under trees is one of my favorite summer activities. Because in the, I'm not a tanner, a person who tans, but I like to be outside during the summer. And so to escape the beating sun, I like to go underneath the shade of a tree. Because even there, it's 10 degrees or more cooler underneath the shade of the tree. It's nice to be there because I've, I've never seen a, sh a tree shake. No matter what's going on around it, in it, under it, or among its branches, it's always a shelter and a safe place for anything that comes under it. Jesus, when he talks about the church, the kingdom of God, he uses a metaphor. He says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed which, when planted, it grows into the biggest tree that you've ever seen. It, and Jesus is teaching us about the kingdom of God. He's teaching us about the holy Christian church, with it, which is Mount Lebanon plus every person who believes in Jesus. He says that's what the church is like, the kingdom of God is like. It's like a spreading tree. And this is what Jesus says about this spreading tree. In Mark chapter 4, he says it, gives, it grows up with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. See, even Jesus, when he thinks about the church and imagines it as a tree, this massive tree, he says that this church is a shelter and a shade for, for anyone who sits under its branches. So in this series where we're thinking about how can we, the church, be a shelter and a shade to anyone who comes under our branches, I think it's worth thinking about who are the people might, who might seek shelter and shade under our branches. Who, who are the people who might, on a welcoming series, who are the people who might walk through their door? What might they have experienced? What they, might they be like? How can we welcome them? Well, one of the groups of people, I think it's pretty obvious. I'll, I'll give you three buckets. We could divide this any number of ways, but bucket number one is this first group of people, they're churched. They, they, they belong to a church. And, and so immediately, I want you to think about Mount Lebanon people, right? And those of you who call Mount Lebanon your home or you call another Lutheran church your home or, or any other Christian church, you can throw the next slide button up there, guys. Thank you. Right? Think about any Christian who belongs to any Christian church. And here I'm not talking about religious groups like Muslims or Mormons or, or Buddhists. or those, those are not Christian churches. I'm talking about people who belong to churches that teach that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that God is our Father who created all things, and whose Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts. If those are Christians, and they might be Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or Pentecostal, this, this Christian church, it extends beyond Mount Lebanon, and it's a beautiful thing. And so who are the who, people who might walk through our doors? They're, they're people who belong to a church, perhaps. Maybe they belong to this one. So as you think about welcoming and how can we be a shelter and a shade, think about the people who come here with you. Think about the people that you go to church with. How can you love them and welcome them and be attentive to them? 
See, one of the things I think as we think about welcomeness is something to be aware of, is we're really good at welcoming people when they come the first or the second time, but what about when they've come 500 times? Do we still treat them with the same love and welcomeness that we did at the very beginning? A second group of people that we can talk about are the unchurched. Maybe this was obvious. They're, they're the unchurched. They're the people. So here you put, like, you can put the categories of the religious and the spiritual, the Buddhist and the Muslim and the agnostic and the atheist, and you can make the list. The people who are, maybe we could call them seekers, who they're looking to find out. They walk through the doors because they want to find out what Mount Lebanon's all about. They want to find out what our Jesus is all about. They want to find out what, all, what our church is all about. So again, think about how can we welcome them? How can we, this is the question that we're asking in the survey today, right? How can we, for somebody who's never experienced Lutheran worship, have never seen a guy up front wearing a white dress or robe, how can we make this a place that's welcoming and approachable so they can walk in and say, okay, I don't understand what's going on here, but I'm okay. You know, like you, when you go to the baseball game, maybe you don't know what first and second and third base is, but when you go to the baseball game, it's okay because everybody else has lost too. <laughs> or somebody else will help you figure it out. So how can we welcome people? How can we be a church that, that even though you don't know the dance steps of Lutheranism, because it is a little bit of a dance, you have to learn the two-step, right? It's a little bit, if you're a guest with us today, it is a little weird, I'll admit it. You're not used to it yet, so how can we as a church be make it a place where they can learn about being Lutheran and Christian here. See, the church, the church is meant to be a shelter and a sanctuary for anybody who walks in here. And so we're asking the question, what can we do? What can, and maybe more specifically, what can you do for the people around you who walk to church with you? What can you do in your life to be a shelter and a sanctuary. I promise I'll get to three. Just give me a second. I've never seen a church, a, a tree shake. Because the tree is, is never really afraid of, guys, you can throw the tree up again. I, I've never seen a tree shake and never be afraid. The other thing I've never seen a tree do is beat itself. I've never sat back and watched a tree kind of like self-destruct. You know, like one branch says, I don't like you, and whacks another branch. <laughs> maybe, maybe it should because like one branch needs a little more light and the other one says, snap it. Right? I've never seen a tree do damage to itself. It would be, you all laughed about it because it's ridiculous. It just wouldn't happen. So my question is, why does the church, if it's like a tree, do damage to itself. See, the third category of people that we could talk about, the people who walk through the church, you could call them the de-churched or the church damaged. Something happened. Something was done to them. Something was done around them that they saw, that they, they said in their hearts, this is not a Christian thing. You know, on the extreme end, we could talk about the sexual abuse scandals that happen in the church, the power abuse things that happen in the church. We could tell stories, and I won't. On the other end, you could talk about the, the squabbles and, the, and, the, and the, the squabbles and the gossiping and the, and the hurting that happens just between the spats that happen among church people. The politics that sometimes happen in the church where somebody does this to somebody else. These are people who have been damaged. There are people who have been damaged by people like me, maybe even by me, or people like you. And so to think about this in the perspective of when people walk through the doors of the church who have been hurt by someone in the church, they're coming in with some fears, some damage, some trauma that makes it hard for them to walk through those doors. I want to briefly say two things to you if, and really to all of you about this. One, and I don't mean to make light of what ha has happened to, to you and other people, but what did you expect? I don't mean to dismiss the, the wounds that you, that you suffered, but when sinful people hang out with sinful people, sinful, thing hap sinful things happen. 
And I'm not trying to excuse the sin. Definitely not doing that. But let's realize, as we live together as a church, realize that we're sinful branches who constantly need pruning from our Father in heaven, who constantly need the Holy Spirit to cleanse us and forgive us. The second thing I want to say is, I'm sorry. On behalf of the church and me, if it was me, I'm sorry. Because the, the abuse and the squabbling and the bickering and the politicking and the, the hurt that we do to each other is not excusable. I'm sorry. If I ever do it to you, please tell me so I can apologize to you. Right? Because we're the church. And if we want to live together in unity, the best way to do it is by confessing and forgiving. That's why we're practicing that in the early part of the service. Me confessing to you, you confessing to me, and us forgiving each other. It's the best way for us to live together as a body of believers. Right? Because the church is meant to be a shelter and a sanctuary for anybody who comes under its branches. This is who we are meant to be. And when we live together in, in confessing and forgiving relationships, right, there's, peace, there's sanctuary in that, is there not? I've never seen a tree shake with fear. I've never tree, seen a tree hurt itself. And I've never seen a whomping willow in real life. I've seen it on Harry Potter, but I've never seen a whomping, I've never been under an oak tree and all of a sudden it started throwing acorns at me. I've never been under a tree where all of a sudden its branches said, get out of here. I want to ask the question, then why do we have such, why, why are we at times so aggressive and hostile, at least inwardly, toward people around us. Why are we like the whomping willow at times, kind of whacking people if, they're not, if they don't fit in? Why do, we, why do we give sideways glances when somebody makes too much noise or doesn't participate in the service the way we think they should? Why are we uncomfortable when somebody wants to pray like this or somebody wants to pray like this? Why, why are we uncomfortable in the different ways that we, where, where somebody wants to say amen because they agree and somebody else just wants to nod? Why are we uncomfortable with that? Why do we at times in our own hearts kind of want to take the, the branches of the tree and say, stop it? I think John starts to help us, doesn't he? He says, there is no fear in love. Or to rephrase it another way, there can't be love when there's fear. You can throw that on the screen, guys. The blank is this. When there is fear, there's no love. See, why might we give the side eyes glance? Because they might ruin the service. Why are we upset? Because we might lose something. Why, why do we fear change in the church? Not, not that I'm trying to turn the church upside down, but why do we sometimes fear it? Because we might lose the truth. I don't want to lose the truth either. We don't want to lose the truth either, right? And at the very bottom of this, what are we afraid of? At the, at the very bottom of all of our fears is not the fear that things will change around here. It's not the fear that we'll lose the truth. It's the fear that we'll lose God. See, John says this, fear has to do with punishment. At its very bottom, if we dig all the way down to what's behind all of our surface level fears, if we dig all the way down, fear has to do with punishment and punishment comes from God. We're afraid that if we do it wrong, we'll lose God. And so we become a little bit like a snarling dog, ready to pounce on anybody who does it wrong. I've never seen a tree shake. 
I've never seen a tree hurt itself. I've never seen a tree attack anybody under its branches. And I've hardly ever seen a tree fall. I don't know about you, but, but when, the wind, when the wind blows, it might break off some branches and some leaves may fall, but the tree continues to stand. Lightning may strike, but it, but it splinters the tree and it doesn't destroy the tree. In fact, it's, you, bugs eat it, right? And they still stand tall way past the time. We cut them down because we're afraid of what may happen, but the tree continues to stand. How much more the church of God? How much more we, the people of God, this little mustard seed that has grown up into this massive tree that becomes a shelter, how much more we, the people of God, who are rooted in the word of God, who are, who are connected and connected to Christ who is the vine and we who are the branches, how much more we? So, so what if we, what if we, the church of God, instead of, trying to, instead of worrying about and being afraid of what might happen if, we, we just made it our effort and our goal in everything we do to love. And what if we ourselves were such a loving community together and evident to the people outside of our church, what if we were so loving that people said, you know what, Mount Lebanon, I don't go there, but that's a church that loves us. And, and what if they started to say about us, you know what, it'd be a sad thing if they went away because they're a blessing to this community. And, and, and what if we, the people of God, worked at loving people without an agenda? You know what I mean? Like, we, we love people and we say, I love you and I want to, this to happen to you. Like, we love our school families because we want them in church. We do want them in church, yes? But what if we love them and said, I will love you even if you never come to church? And then we didn't shoehorn Jesus in, but just took the every opportunity we had to love and proclaim Jesus when we could and then invite to church. Where it fit, right? And, and what if in our relationships with our neighbors and with our community, we just said, I'm going to love you, I'm going to do good for you, even if you never walk through the doors of our church and we're going to be okay with that. Like our goal is, is not just to do good and feed people. We want them to have heavenly, heavenly things. I don't want to miss that part of this. But what if we just loved them and out of love for them we proclaimed Christ? And what if we loved fearlessly? John says this, what, what it get rid of, gets rid of fear? Perfect love drives out fear. But John is not talking about your love. He's talking about God's love for you. He's talking about the Father's love for you that's perfect and complete in every way. A, a love for you that sent his son. John, John, remember, John's the one who wrote John 3.16 too. God loved the world this way. Perfect love. So that he gave his son. Who, who put us where we are, when we are, around the people we're around so that we would first know him and then be able to share him. And that's perfect love. I'm talking, John's talking about the perfect love of Jesus who risked everything to gain you. He gave up heaven for a time and became a human being, took on flesh, love in this with skin on, Came, became flesh and lived among us and died for us and then rose again from the dead to, to drive out fear. See, why, why is there no more punishment for us? Because Jesus. Because Jesus took the punishment. All the punishment for all your sins, all your failures, all your, all your lovelessness, all your wounding other Christians, all your wounding other people, all your loveless actions. He paid the, he paid the price. He was punished in your place. Perfect love. His perfect love drives out fear and his Holy Spirit too. His Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of you. See, God did not give us the spirit of fear and timidity 
but a spirit of, his spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Right? His spirit lives in you and his spirit drives out fear. Christ is the tree, the, the vine. We are the branches. And, if we, and since we are just the branches, then it is just our job to love and be fruitful. Our only job as branches is to love and be fruitful as God gives us the opportunity, as the Spirit works in us. That's our only job. Our job is not to make sure this tree stands firm. Our job is not to make sure that, that our job is not to make sure that the church doesn't fall apart and crumble and fall. Our job is not to fill the pews. Our job is to love and be fruitful. It is Jesus' job to love. I pro- and I realized I should have made this Trinitarian on Trinitarian Sunday. It is the Father's job to create and protect and provide and order our lives. It is the Son's job to die and to bring people into the church. It is, it is the Spirit's job to, to connect people to Christ so that they become part of the tree. Not just people sheltering under the tree, but people who are part of the tree giving shelter to all people. It's Jesus' job to save. It's Jesus' job to love. It's our triune God's job to make sure the tree stands. And stand it will. We've all seen trees that fall. We've all seen trees that decay and no longer serve their original purpose. But this mustard seed that became a spreading shade tree will stand forever not because of the branches but because its roots are settled in the the rock bed of God's word because its cornerstone its most important piece is Christ and because our God will not fail us Amen? amen Now the God of peace grant you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen.